Hey book lovers, I'm Elise and welcome or welcome back to my channel. I cannot believe that it is already September 1st, but thankfully that means my favorite part of the year is coming, which is fall. So today I wanted to share with you my absolute favorite TBR and that is my fall TBR. I made a TBR last year. I did not finish every book on that TBR, so quite a few of them are making a reappearance this year. And of course, there are some new ones that have been added as well. The first book I wanna talk about is The September House by Carissa Orlando. This book obviously has to be read in the month of September. When Margaret and her husband, Hal, bought the large Victorian house on Hawthorne Street for sale at a surprisingly reasonable price, they couldn't believe they finally had a home of their own. Then they discovered the hauntings. Every September, the walls drip blood. The ghosts of former inhabitants appear and all of them are terrified of something that lurks in the basement. Most people would flee. The next book is Slewfoot by Brahm. Again, cannot believe that I have yet to read this book. I've had it on my TBR for quite some time. So it takes place in Connecticut in 1666. Interesting year choice. An ancient spirit awakes in a dark wood. The wild folk call him father, slayer, protector. Colonists call him Slewfoot, demon, devil. To Abtha, a recently widowed outcast, alone and vulnerable in her pious village, he is the only one she can turn to for help. Together, they ignite a battle between pagan and Puritan, one that threatens to destroy the entire village, leaving nothing but ashes and bloodshed in its wake. Probably one of my favorite covers of any book that I own. Next is A Dark Fantasy, which is Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher. I love T. Kingfisher. Not every book of hers. I did not actually enjoy A House with Good Bones. As the shy convent raised third-born daughter, she escaped the traditional fate of princesses to be married away for the sake of an uncaring throne. But her sister wasn't so fortunate, and after years of silence, Mara is done watching her suffering at the hands of a powerful and abusive prince. Seeking help for her rescue mission, Mara is offered the tools she needs, but only if she can complete three seemingly impossible tasks. Build a dog of bones, sew a cloak of nettles, capture moonlight in a jar. But as is the way in Tales of Princes and Witches, doing the impossible is only the beginning. I'm obsessed with those end pages. Next up is Ninth House and Hellbent by Leigh Bardugo. I did start reading Ninth House last fall, I think it was. It just kind of got away from me for some reason and I never picked it back up, but I do plan on starting it over and then, of course, following it up with the sequel, which is Hellbent. Next up is Masters of Death by Olive e. Blake. For some reason, I get the impression that this book might be a little humorous. I think it follows a vampire who's trying to sell this house. Viola Merrick is a struggling real estate agent and a vampire, but her biggest problem currently is that the house she needs to sell is haunted. The ghost haunting the house has been murdered, and until he can solve the mystery of how he died, he refuses to move on. Fox Demora is a medium, and though he is also most definitely a shameless fraud, he isn't entirely without his uses, seeing as he's actually the godson of death. But with the help of an unruly poltergeist, a demonic personal trainer, a sharp-voiced angel, a love-stricken raper, and a few mindfulness practicing creatures, Vi and Fox soon discover that the difference between a mysterious lost love and an annoying dead body isn't nearly as distinct as they thought. Next up is Starling House by Alex E. Harrow. I have read The Once and Future Witch it was written really, really well. I did enjoy the writing style, but like the story didn't pull me in as much as I would have liked. So I'm a little apprehensive about this one, but it's not nearly as big because The Once and Future Witches was a chunker. Opal is a lot of things, orphan, high school dropout, full-time cynic, and part-time cashier. But above all, she's determined to find a better life for her younger brother, Jasper. One that gets them out of Eden, Kentucky, a town remarkable for only two things, Bad Luck and E. Starling, the reclusive 19th century author of The Underland, who disappeared over a hundred years ago. All she left behind were dark rumors and her home. Okay, so the Starling House, the house of the author. Everyone agrees that it's best to ignore the uncanny mansion and its misanthropic heir, Arthur. Almost everyone. Opal has been obsessed with the Underland since she was a child. When she gets the chance to step inside Starling House and make some extra cash for her brother's escape fund, she can't resist. But sinister forces are digging deeper into the buried secrets of Starling House, and Arthur's own nightmares have become far too real. As Eden itself seems to be drowning in its own ghosts, Opal realizes that she might find finally have found a reason to stick around. Next up is Vampires of El Norte by Isabel Cañas, and actually The Hacienda by Isabel Cañas as well. Mexican Gothic meets Rebecca in this debut supernatural suspense novel set in the aftermath of the Mexican War of Independence about a remote house, a sinister haunting, and the woman pulled into their clutches. And then Vampires of El Norte, Vampires and Vaqueros face off on the Texas-Mexico border in the supernatural western from the author of The Hacienda. This one takes place in 1840s Mexico. Next up is an author that we saw previously, which is The Familiar by Lee Bardugo. This one takes place in the 1500s, I believe. Perhaps not. I don't know why I thought it was the 1500s. Oh, the chapters might tell us. The chapters do not. 
Americans, so I could be totally wrong. I don't know what year this takes place, but it is historical. In a shabby house on a shabby street in the new capital of Madrid, Lucia Cotado uses scraps of magic to get through her days of endless toil as a scullion. But when her scheming mistress discovers that a lump of a servant cowering in the kitchen is actually hiding a talent for little miracles, she demands Lucia use those gifts to better the family's social position. What begins a simple amusement for the nobility takes a perilous turn when Lucia garners the notice of Antonio Perez, the disgraced secretary of Spain's king. Still reeling from the defeat of his armada, the king is desperate for any advantage in the war against England's heretic queen, and Perez will stop at nothing to regain the king's favor. Determined to seize this one chance to better her fortunes, Lucia plunges into a world of seers and alchemists, holy men and hucksters, where the lines between magic, science, and fraud are never certain. But as her notoriety grows, so does the danger that her Jewish blood will doom her to the Inquisition's wrath. She will have to use every bit of her wit and will to survive, even if that means enlisting the help of an embittered immortal familiar whose own secrets could prove deadly for both of them. And finally, another book that can't believe I haven't read yet, The Invited by Jennifer McMahon. This book is about a couple who starts to build their dream home, but a lot of the materials that they use are just things that they've kind of found around the property. Unfortunately for them, some of those items are cursed. So in putting it into their brand new home that they're building, they're kind of accidentally creating a cursed haunted home. Okay friends, there you have it. Those are all the books that I am 93% sure that I will read this fall season. Let me know if you've read any of these and which ones I should prioritize and let me know some of your most anticipated reads for this season. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, bye.